get it out of your system because I'm going to need you to shut up for the next hour. So. <laughs> Yes, you are. So, I know not all of you are here for this. Some of you are, but we have an InfoSec career panel. This is the panel. They'll tell you all about themselves in a second. For the rest of you, I need you to be quiet or go somewhere else just for an hour. Then you can come back and yell at me. Is that fair? All right. If you want to ask a question, this is the panel question asking spot. So, line up and... Uh, after they're done introducing themselves, you can ask them anything you want, InfoSec related. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, th thanks, David Graham. Well, welcome to the uh, InfoSec career panel. Um, the, go the, the goal today is to provide some advice for you aspiring hackers, security enthusiasts that are looking to get started and advance your careers in the industry. So to do that, we've assembled a group of experienced professionals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to share their thoughts and experiences on how they got here and what you too can do to succeed in this business. So, uh, on my right, let me introduce the panelists. We've got uh, Jeffrey J J uh, Janjua from Exubra Operations Group. He's a former U.S. DOD civilian with 12 years in the field experience. Next, we've got Matthew Stitz, security architect with Adobe, 20 years experience. So fancy. We've got Sam Brown, teaching at the City College in San Francisco, computer networking and security since 2000. And he's been a speaker at many cons and training sessions. And then, of course, there's Jack Baker, pen tester extraordinaire, bug bounty hacker, reverse engineer, and finder of O days. And last but not least, Patrick Albert, director of security engineering. App Dynamics, experienced guy in DevOps and security. Yeah. And I'm Mark Lippart. Uh, I've been a director of security, done executive positions in the industry, and currently um, involved in computer forensics investigations. So, so where do we start? Well, there's no real true path to getting into this industry. People come at it from all different disciplines. Everything from technical, computer science, philosophy, history, could be any. But what they all share is a deep interest in how the technology works, and that's the thing you need to know. You need to know exactly what you're protecting and the reasons things are insecure. So to that end, a lot of people start out with getting into general IT positions, uh, and they kind of work their way through then. They learn what the basics are, and uh, they try to create a path from that. So uh, that's a good start. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And what you want to be doing if you're really looking towards a career in this industry is thinking like five, ten years out. Kind of decide for yourself what areas you're interested in, and that will help you forge a path and pick the right jobs to take you on that way. So, to start out, the first question for anybody can answer this here. Uh, what suggestions can you offer for starter jobs that are good for moving towards an InfoSec job, and, and maybe why? I think um, I've seen, sorry. So I've seen a couple of folks, a couple of different career paths people traverse on some uh, into kind of at least from pen testing, which is what I do uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I, they come from kind of tend to come from three areas. One is one is uh, system administration, right? So folks come from system administration side. They know how the systems worked and are built. Uh, that's like network admin too. So Cisco side, that kind of thing. But I also see folks come from software dev, right? So that's like, um, you know, your traditional developers and those kind of things. And then folks who are doing maybe more low-level stuff in the, in the embedded universe. So th that's what I've seen. I don't know about you guys, but those are the three kind of areas I see come, folks come into pen testing, which is a kind of a specialized discipline. Yeah. So, go ahead, Stitz. Yeah, it, it, it varies so broadly. It's fundamentally, like, do you ask questions? What do you observe? What do you report back? Like, just having a, like, that fundamental mindset Maybe not even in tech initially as a start. I mean, there's, there's so many amazing people in InfoSec that started in like the social sciences or something of that nature. But in terms of where to start with an initial role, I mean, you can't, you can't beat a sock in my mind, like yeah. just see it all. Or even working in a consultancy and maybe not even a technical role initially and transitioning into that and just seeing a lot of companies and how they approach security, like from a fundamental ph philosophical perspective. I think there's huge value in that. Like initially not even assessing the technology, but just assessing how people view technology. Do, do you think it's a, a business problem? I think I see oh, a lot absolutely. of a lot of folks yeah. talk about technical, but um, from doing consulting, doing a lot of work, it, it is really a 
Yes. It's a business it's, issue. It, it's fundamentally, it's, it's that operational debt, it's the technical debt, it's understanding the risk that the business is faced with, how it's being communicated, how it's being understood. I think we're supposed Absolutely. to encourage them. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, not, not, Sorry, that, that, that is encouragement, I promise. That, yeah, all, all, sincerely, that is encouragement. But in terms of where to start with initial, yeah, to yeah. get back to the question, sorry for a slight digression there. If, <laughs> if, if you're, if you're going to start, I, I would really sincerely have, I would say start at a SOC, start in a consultancy. I think those two, in any level, will get you so much exposure. Like, a year in a consultancy is five years at a corporation, in my mind. Well, I have something very different to say, but I have to warn you that I don't know anything. See, these guys are actually professionals in the field, but I know what happens to my students. And none of them can make a five-year plan or a 10-year plan because it changes so fast. And they don't have the luxury of choosing where to go. They take what they can get. And five years ago, they couldn't get in security. They would have to do something else like network operations for a few years before they trust you to move you up. But in the last two or three years, many of them are starting right out in security. And companies have told us they would, they'll hire you if you've done the um, embedded device CTF or if you pat the OSCP or any kind of reasonable uh, evidence that you know something, they'll hire you. They just want you to, and I, I don't, so I don't tell them this kind of advice, I just say, make sure you love what you're doing and learn something well. And if you impress people, there's room for you because this is a very chaotic field. And I think there are no rules, really. You, you just have to be great at something. Anyway. No, I, I'd concur on the OSCP. I think it's a, it's a, some of those are really valuable in terms of demonstrating that you actually know something. It doesn't guarantee it, but it's, it's helpful to, yeah. as an as a initial filter. Those, yeah. those certif certificates in general are they're watermarks, right? It's yeah, yeah. exactly. Certificates in general are, are watermarks. They're not necessarily a gauge of your talent or your skill, but it's something that we accept that you know now. Absolutely. Um, even I'll even give the CISSP a shout out here. I mean, <laughs> I, I will. I will I mean, for I'll real. Like everyone's go OSCP because it's hardcore and it, it's long and deep. But CISSP is an inch deep and a mile wide. I, and I'll give you something for persistence, right? Because it's like this is not an easy gig, right? You're going to have to be persistent. So if you've got the kind of persistence to go work through some of that stuff on your own, I'll give you a lot of credit, even if it doesn't really mean you know a ton of stuff. It's just you worked really hard to do it. And I'll give you, the, I'll give you credit for that. And to Sam, Jeff, and uh, Patrick's point too, even, even just participating in an open source project and getting that exposure, yeah. putting that on a resume is a fast track for most HR departments. That's definitely something to consider. So, um, so those are a lot of great ideas. Um, w let's say, what, what would you describe as maybe some of the ideal characteristics of uh, a cybersecurity candidate, somebody coming in looking for a job, what types of things would you be looking to see from them? Transparency. That they'll, they'll tell you what they don't know. 100% say, I don't know if you don't know it. Please don't lie to me. Good God. I, I, yeah, when, I, when I'm interviewing someone and they actually say, I don't know what that is, I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I had something to say down there. I saw the. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I've got things. Uh, so, so I spend a good portion of every week of my life either screening or on site yeah. or with yeah, yeah. people, uh, trying to place them either in my org or in my company. Um, but the things that I care about are not necessarily your technical proficiencies or uh, how you can answer the questions, but how much you care about them and how hungry you are to actually figure it out. So if I see you attack a problem in front of me, even if you hit a wall 10 times, um, if you persist, um, that's when I start caring. That's when things feel better for me. Because we can't, where we sit now as an industry, I mean, how many open jobs do we have with how many qualified candidates? Uh, we can't sit around and wait for that yeah. person with 20 years of experience to land on our lap. We it, actually it, have to yeah, there's, there's, hire, build, and grow. And every technology change, the technology changes so often. You can't be an expert in absolutely everything. And there's no way to get that perfect PhD candidate who is, knows the technology. All of a sudden, it's just never going to happen. So you've got to make... Hire for aptitude. Yeah, it, you look, you're, you're scouting for aptitude, right? It's not, yeah, it's not always uh, yeah. about who can answer security questions, it's about who cares the most. I, I would also say in a consultancy, which is something you know, that is really important, is the, is the people skills, people forget this. Soft you're gonna skills. have to communicate, 
You're gonna have to commu very b communicate very bad news to very important people all the time. All the time, <laughs> every day. <laughs> and so and it can't to, be adversarial. Yeah. Yeah, it can't yeah. be ha ha ha. Yeah. Look what you I did. You actually have to it's, sell them a yeah. steaming pile of. Yeah, exactly. Like, hey. say, respectfully, <laughs> like this is why this has happened. <laughs> yeah. and here's what it is, and I've taken it just not even respectfully. This is bad. We know it's bad. Can we not do this anymore? Yeah. I need your help, right? I need your help to fix it. Exactly. Help me help you. Yeah. So you got to be able to communicate those soft skills. It's tremendously valuable. I, I think, think that's actually one thing most candidates miss completely for me, uh, especially when they attack things from a technical perspective, is actually being able to sit down and discuss or, or conversate, period. Um, soft skills, they're, they're immensely... Yeah, I, you yeah, know, I got to agree with you there. That's the one thing that often seems to be overlooked when we focus on the technical aspects and you know, I can write perfect code and do all this crazy stuff. The communications is really a key thing in in this job, in any job, actually, because if you can't communicate your ideas or the situation, you're not going to get very far. Nobody will know how smart and brilliant you are. And, you know, from a career standpoint, as you move up the ladder, so to speak, and take on positions with more responsibility and or management, communications is really vital to being able to uh, convey what you're, what you're doing, what your team is doing, and, and why. Um, so I, I think that's really a big thing that's sometimes overlooked. We're, we're a team. It, it, the team player aspect, I have seen people hired because not necessarily that they were the uber greatest, but that they were a better team player. They, people wanted to work with them rather than the other person because you can always level up your skills, but if you're a total dick, <laughs> uh, it's not going to play out. You can't fix personality. Yeah, you can't fix a personality. <laughs> Don't be a dick. Personalities, it's really tough. So... And, and also, you know, you want to look for somebody that has problem-solving skills because you're going to get thrown at things that you don't know. And you've got to really be able to, to dig into those things, figure stuff out, put the pieces together, and f come up with solutions. So I think problem-solving skills, any, anyone that can demonstrate that in the different ways that that might be done uh, is going to be a plus in, in an interview situation. Can I offer some technical Absolutely. So outside of the... Um, the soft skills, which I think are super important, I would say that a interest and desire to understand how computers fundamentally work and how the code works, how the systems work, and the you may not know it, but being able to understand the technical information presented to you is very, very valuable because you're going to have to go slog through docs. You're going to have to go look at source code. You're going to have to potentially go work with tools that are very low-level kind of diagnostic tools to go figure out how does this actually do the thing it's supposed to do, and does it, does it do the thing I expect it to do, or does it do the thing the developer expects it to do? Does it function the way it's intended? And, and that is not an easy thing to do, and you need to be prepared to kind of self-teach to some degree in those technical skills, but I would say software, any software development skills you have are very valuable, any, uh, because they translate language to language, any system administration skills you have that are very, are very valuable, any, any kind of infrastructure building experience and big infrastructure projects, so that's like, you know, you work at an ISP, you know how routing works, you know, what, you, know, you know what signaling is, you know how that stuff works, you've done computer forensics, you know what bits are on the file system, how file systems are constructed. Those are very valuable in a genuine technical situation because it means you can problem solve and work out uh, something new. Well, there's something I heard go by here, but I want to say it more explicitly. The the most important thing is that you really love technology. You can't be just trying to make a paycheck and do the minimum or you'll never make it. Because you have, it, I hope that's why everybody's here, because you're a hobbyist. There is something you love that you really want to build or understand or change because you can't get paid enough to do this. You have to spend your whole life digging through things and they have to be really interesting to you. I have a few students who clearly don't really want to do this. They're hoping to make money, and they're never going to make it. Because, I mean, I remember every, when I developed my first set of Linux classes, it really took me 36 hours to make every one of those work. Because I didn't know any of it. I had to dig and dig and go down blind alleys. If that's something you're forcing yourself to do, it's never going to work. You have to really love the technology. Some part of it. There's got to be some part of it that is yours that you really understand because you care. And if you don't have that, please go work in something else because you're never, you're never going to make it if you're just like trying to put it, check the boxes. You know. I, think, I yeah. think the inverse of that is just you have to hate so yourself I, enough I think, to do this. I think what Sam's saying, yeah, I, I, think what, I think what Sam's saying is you have a career in internal audit. Yes, yeah, so. that's right. <laughs> yeah, you know, 
<laughs> a, a, a line that I a line that I often have used is said it's it's not really a career it's a lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not a job it's a lifestyle. It's more, and, it's more like art. You have to have a passion and yeah. love it. If you don't, then you'll never be happy and you'll never be good at yeah, it. Because it's not a nine to five job. It requires more than and, that at and, times. And worst of all, you'll make everyone around you possibly very miserable. Something to consider. Okay. Well, they're likely to do that anyway. <laughs> so let me ask. I'm. Just out of college, I'm starving. I'm putting my resume together. What resume looks like, hey, you actually enjoy what you're doing? Like, what are you looking for? Wait, are you interviewing the panel? Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, if, hey, that was me. one of my questions. That, no, that, that that's a, actually that, the next that, question. No, that, that's a oh. great question, though. I mean, for, for me, at least, when, when I get a resume, especially for someone just out of college, I want to see what projects they're working on. I want to see what other skill sets they have, what their interests are, that they're well-rounded. Um, that, that to me is way more interesting, uh, especially like if it's, hey, that's great, you had a 3.8 or 4.0 at MIT, uh, that's cool, that's wonderful that you can talk to me for two hours about compiler theory, but what, what projects did you work on? What, what else did you go Demonst into? Demonstrate, into demonstrate your capability yeah. today, that's what I want to see. Yeah, ab absolutely. Demonstrate your capability. Show me, show me you can do something, and I will definitely want to talk to you. Show that's, me the money. Yeah, show me, show me you can do something cool, right? And maybe it's not... Hackery, right? Maybe it's not you don't have a bunch of CVEs or O days. That's cool. But if you have a bunch of dev projects or you modded a badge here at whatever, that's cool. I want to see any any applied knowledge. Any applied yeah. knowledge. Show me you didn't read a book and regurgitated the answers. Show me you did something different. Yeah, and and something that you've seen through to the end. That's right. Your completion is important. A lot of started projects that are ninety percent complete. Something that you've gone hundred percent in on. Okay, so. We touched on this question a little bit earlier, briefly, but I want to ask it formally. Um, how important are certifications, and are there any particular certs that, uh, that you recommend for whatever? Eh. <laughs> Meh. <laughs> the harder the cert, the more interesting it is, but in general, certs are kind of 50-50 for me. Yep. Usually, if you've got certs listed, it's uh, I'll talk to you. Yeah, maybe it's a maybe. Yeah, I, right. I, I will say this: that I completely agree with what everyone's saying here. The one value of a cert is it gets you past that first yep. hurdle with an HR recruiter. Right. Yeah, it, it might get you past the the a resume filter, which is valuable, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee you're going to get a position. Right. It's like just because you've got a CISSP or you've got your OSCP or you've gotten your OSCE or whatever, that's that's cool, but. I don't know if I would say I would hire anyone based upon anything other than my personal practical examination. I do, we, when we hire, we do a, a practical pen test. Like, hey, here's, you have, you have 24 hours, go hack some stuff, show us what you did, right? Show us how you did it. That's what we ask you to do. You say you're a pen tester, show me, prove it. Now, speaking as someone who had no real background or education or anything really, uh, who wanted to get into pen testing, um, <laughs> I, uh, I spent about all the money I had to get the OSCP, and I think that's the only reason that I now have a job doing pen testing. It, so it, yeah. if there's anyone else in that situation, that would probably be my recommendation. I, I think it is valuable, like I said, to get you past the HR hurdle. But you still have to apply that knowledge on the job and show me you can do it. There's the, the two different aspects here. So we, we have a hacker who wants to do things better and wants to learn more. Yeah. So he goes and he gets a certificate. That's a great way to go and learn. Yeah. So we, yeah. we appreciate that as hiring managers. But there's also the other side of this coin, which is um, there's certificate factories offshore that print people certs, and they have uh, 20 of them. And that lands more often than not um, somebody with OSCP who just came up from nothing. Yeah, I mean, you can see the, the, the progression, I think, a lot of times. You can see somebody who's done it on their own versus somebody who is kind of Meh, you're just kind of trying to check the boxes. It, it, it is, it's, it's kind of transparent in the resume, typically. You can kind of see how people do it, right? If it's like I did, if I worked in business logic, business management or something, and then I decided I want to be a hacker, hey, and then I went and did a bunch like Security Plus and Network Plus and all this other stuff, that's cool. I'm glad you're going and doing the effort, but the question I have is how deep are your technical skills, and that's why I want to see you do something more difficult, potentially like the OSCP. If I saw somebody go from business management and go take the OSCP and pass it in a year, I'd be like, this person is pretty serious about what they're doing, I, right? Actually, I want to ask you guys, what, what certs do you think are valuable? Because we, we, we won't say that they're not valuable. No, define valuable. Uh, well, as, it, yeah. I guess that's what I'm asking. Like, what, what are you looking for in a cert? I mean, there's the, the common ones we all know of, the OSCPs, the OSCP. CSSPs, CEH, whatever. Uh, CEH, Security Plus, what do you think of that stuff? I, I will tell you, the only, the only, I think offsec stuff is okay. Right? It doesn't guarantee any knowledge. I've seen folks pass the OSCP 
and I'm question how they did it because I'm like, mm, I don't know how that happened. But um, I would say that's pro anything that where you don't do a practical examination, I have really no interest in. Right. Like if you don't do a project or do something real in real life and demonstrate the capability in real life, if you're regurgitating answers, if it's check the box, answer A, B, C, or fill multiple in the blank, choice. multiple choice, not interested. Real quick, uh, since we're using the term a lot, if you don't know what the OSCP is, it's the Offensive Security Certified Professional. Yeah, it's a, it's a practical exam. Yeah. How long does the exam take? How long do you have? <laughs> the exam takes three days, or 36 hours. It's it's, and uh, you have to hack into six boxes. It's 24 hours, five yeah, systems. Yeah, 24 hours, five systems, you have 24 hours to write a report. It is hard. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let me ask this question then. Um, so you're, you're, you're new, you're trying to get in the thing, you don't have a security consulting job, you're not working in a SOC, uh, you know, maybe you're a database administrator or whatever, uh, but you want to get into security. So what other sorts of s training or things can you do self-training self, uh, that would be helpful and move you in that direction? For a, for a for a pen tester, there's lots of vulnerable stuff on the internet, right? So there's like VulnHub, there's a bunch of other junk out that that's free. It sucks to work with because it's really clunky, but it is free, right? If you have an internet connection and a desire to go learn this, man, if you search for hacking tutorial on Google, I bet you will have a lot of hits, right? There's a lot of stuff out there. There's a million books if you hit Amazon. Not all of them are going to be good. Not all of them are going to be valuable, but come here, do CTFs, do that kind of stuff. You'll get good. I guarantee you, if you do, if you did CTF 365 every weekend, right? You'd be pretty damn good at doing some reverse engineering and code, writing code and stuff at the end of the year. I guarantee it. There's no way. You just work on it every day, you're going to be good. Anything you practice every day, you're going to be good. All right. I want to contradict all of that. Yeah. The, um, all right. That's awesome. Because this is what I do. All the vulnerable stuff on the internet, none of it is training material. It's all just final exams. You give you a vulnerable machine, they say, there, hack into it. And you say, but, but I don't know what to do. And they say, well, you should know what to do. And I say, well, what good is that? Um, there's only a few that actually guide you through. Um, I found a place called Pentester Lab that's like 30 bucks a month that's pretty good. There's uh, Vivek Raman Chadran's thing, uh, Security, what is it? Uh, Security Tube and Pentester something or other, uh, Pentester Academy or something, where you pay a fee and they guide you through. And there's Pico CTF from Carnegie Mellon, which is very good for beginners because there's a lot of challenges and it's about a year old, so there's a bunch of blogs that will show you how to get through. But a beginner needs instructions, and for some reason, almost all the training material on the web forgets to give you any instructions, so it's really not helpful. But once you get going, then you can start doing the CTFs and stuff, but, but really, you need some training, not just exams. I don't know. There is a ton. I mean, like, if you go on, I mean, I don't want to, like, bicker about it, but I'm just saying that I think that, like, <laughs> If I have looked at, there's so much material out there, I think the problem is not so much that there's no material, it's that there's so much garbage. Too much. There's too much, it's almost impossible to figure out what's quality and what's not. Well, well I, uh, this is just what I do. I figure stuff out and write classes, and what I've found is the books and the training videos and the blogs are very little use, none of them actually work. They worked on that person's system five years ago with old versions of everything, if you do the six, the half of the steps they don't tell you about that they assume you already know. But if you actually try to get from zero to where they got by following their steps, it usually is very difficult. So I mean, in the long run, that's what you want. If you were an expert, you could work from out of date material for the wrong operating system and figure it out. But when you're a beginner, you really need something that doesn't present you with too many baffling, frustrating hurdles on the way up. And you pretty much have to have real training materials for that. And there are some, but you know the vulnerable machines are not that. Anyway, how about how about some tools that you can play with? Maybe things like Kali Linux or something that people yeah. can get for free and can get started using something. Yeah. No, that, yeah, that, that, that's spot on. I mean, just in my mind, just fundamentally coming to an event like this and bringing a laptop and having Kali or Parrot on it, and just having conversations with people. Hey, what, what can I do with this tool? What have you seen with this? What else can I accomplish with this? Oh, how, how do I use TCP replay in this scenario? And having those kinds of conversations and just building from there, I think that's, that's a huge part of it, just getting the tools and playing with them. And re this is gonna sound re funny, but RTFM, like, <laughs> it really does go a long ways. I, I don't Hold think on, wait, it, who knows what that means? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, 
Yeah, I, I think a lot of the CTFs have write-ups and some of that stuff, and you will find a ton of people who are willing to be helpful, especially at cons like this, be like, hey, how, the, how did you solve that, dude? Right? Yeah. How did you figure that out? And they'll be like, oh, I'll show you this thing, that thing, and you can get some actual help there. I, I think part of it is building your network of technical people you can lean on, right? And co coming to events like this is really valuable, especially smaller cons. I will say shout-outs to, like, Torcon and Layer 1 and all these other, like, kind of smaller stuff. If you go to like a big con like Black Hat, dude, nobody yeah. gives a shit about you there. <laughs> you know? Well, unless you have a budget. <laughs> if you don't yeah, have seven yeah, figures to yeah. draw, no one's no one interested. No one's interested. Here, you're actually going to meet people, know people. These people are in the local area. You know That's what I mean? Yeah. You can yeah. go. You can go hang out with these dudes on the weekends. Go talk to people here and be like, "Hey, dude, I was working on this problem. You you want to help me out? I do not know how to solve this. Half of it is leveraging your network. You know." Well, you're gonna leave for a job also at, at cons like this, you're more likely to have a chance to really relate and talk to somebody. And, and then kind of, it's almost like an in, uh, informal interview, and you might get uh, you might get farther with that. I love No Space Labs. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, just to touch on what they're saying, I think uh, I wouldn't have a job or a career if it wasn't for a couple people in this room and probably this conference and DEF CON, like period. Um, so that, like, that's what's up. Like no yeah. network, no friends, no exactly. learning experiences. Yeah, uh, I didn't get college. Uh, I didn't have a lot of fun. I, Went and did military crap and then came back and tried to figure it out. Um, but just having a strong network and actually uh, people who think like you and want to help you. Uh, build champions and, and make friends. I mean, I think everybody on this, I, I would argue that everybody on this panel probably came non-traditionally into their career, right? You did not follow the prescribed career path. And we're sensitive to that, right? I don't care if you don't have a degree. I don't care about any of that stuff. I'm going to try to work for you and make it work. If you're good and squared away and want to do the job, I'm going to try to do what I can to help you, right? So I think everybody in this, on this panel would probably say the same thing. I don't know if anybody would disagree with that. Yeah, I still don't know how I got here. <laughs> I, I just want to mention something. I don't know why you're here. No, yeah. About the... the <laughs> connections people make. I had a student that went to a con and volunteered to help, and all he did was get drunk and hand out t-shirts, and I gave him extra credit for that, because that's important. The friends you make are very valuable. Anyway. Good on drunk students and <laughs> <laughs> extra points. Extra points for layer one. Hey, so, um, you know, there are some paid training things out there that are fairly decent. I, I want to mention, I don't know if it's controversial, I want to mention SANS. SANS yeah. does some good, I know they do some good forensics and some they other charge classes. charge too much money. Well, they're extremely expensive. Yeah, if you got the, they are expensive, but well, it's it's, either that or it is a college. good experience. If you can get your job should come to, training to pay at for one. that to upgrade your skills, though, um, you know, that's worthwhile doing. You should, you should definitely come to training at Layer 1. We did it Friday. <laughs> okay. okay. Yes. Next. Well, um, hey, let's open it up to some questions from the audience. Has anybody got any questions to stump the panel? Go ahead, take the microphone there, sir. Oh, there's a line. Uh, going back to the concept of soft skills, working with other people, there's a big difference between uh, software QA, working with developers, and working with outside clients, and I'd like to get a little bit more feedback for that, because in the past, I'm mainly an engineer, worked with other engineers, and sometimes, uh, you know, when I did a stint in software QA, going over and talking to the developers was one way of getting things across. Some of the developers were easy to work with. Other guys, I would never call them on the phone because there was no way of communicating with them on the phone and, uh, without sitting down there, down there in their cubicle. So I'd like a little bit more about the soft skills working with outside clients because pen testing is mainly going to be with somebody else outside not working with somebody in your organization that you have a chance to know. I mean, I, I would say if you can communicate bad news to someone, that's what you're yeah. going to do. You're, right? you're, so, you're a constant salesman. Yeah. You're, you, so, okay. you're selling shit. So imagine you're, you've got a shit sandwich and you want this guy to take a bite and then tell you how great it tastes afterwards. That's the job you've got to basically do. Yeah. You've got to get that down and be like, hey, look, I know it sucks right now, but we're going to work this out. Right, so that's the soft skills I'm talking about, and it's not necessarily just—it's not like a sales gig, but I would say that the ability to communicate bad news in a non-confrontational, non-emotional manner and get to the solution, because the objective is a business solution, right? The answer, the, the bottom line is, we are here to help our clients, and sometimes that means communicating bad news, and sometimes it means helping them understand what the problem is in a way that gets them to the answer. If you tell them the bad news and they go, "Screw you! I don't want to hear from you." You have screwed them over. You have done that disservice to your client because they cannot get it fixed because they're going to ignore your advice, right? 
So I would say the soft skills you need are to talk to people and tell them bad news in a very non-confrontational manner, in a very soft way. If you're, if you're, if you're talking specifically about internal communications, essentially it sounds like I want to walk downstairs and talk to Bob. And Bob, I need your help. Yeah, and Bob's like, I really don't have time for you right now. Like, there's, there's, it's, it's actually a different set of skills, right? Um, so it's, it's making sure that you can build those relationships and kind of what I do, and I'm, I'm kind of a jerk about it, though, is I, I put money in the bank with my, my teams and my developers, and I make sure that we're always doing each other favors. Um, so if you have a chance to build relationships like that, I encourage it. Yeah, be nice to the people on your way up the ladder, because they're the same ones you'll meet on the way back down. I don't think, I think, if anything, it's, it's the network you, you build as in your career that helps you get that done, right? So I think communicating to the technical people is sometimes a lot easier uh, than computing to, communicating to leadership, because you're communi you can communicate facts. You talk to an engineer, you'd be like, you know, water's wet, electricity hurts when you touch it, you know, these are not confrontational discussions, right? You guys have a bad product and your, your bonus is on the line is not a fun conversation to have with a CTO, right? Yeah. <laughs> they, you know, so I think it's a different discussion sometimes. Yeah, I mean, when, when, you're, when you're dealing with like a scenario like you've described where you're working in QA and you're going back and reporting a bug to someone, th those can sometimes be major fundamental conversations that go back to architectures that could be like a decade old. Hey, why, is, why do I have a deserialized object here? Well, our foundational tech stack, et cetera, et cetera. It's not your fault, it's right? Not, yeah, it's not your fault, <laughs> right? But, but we need someone that we need to work on how to fix it. It might take three years. So, okay, we're going to triage this. We're going to document it. We're going to acknowledge it. And we're going to do what we can to add additional processes for integration testing, what have you. And yeah, exactly. And, that, and that's the thing. Like, you don't come with like a critical, even if it's a critical, you say, this is critical. We understand it's critical. We also understand this is going to take four engineers five quarters to resolve. If you phrase it, if you, if you yeah. frame it as though I need your help, you can be the hero. Yeah. That's a Abs much better absolutely. conversation to have absolutely. than it is like, you guys screwed up. And, you need to fix this. And they'll thank you for it. They'll literally yeah. say thank you. That's, not, a, that's yeah. not an exaggeration. Yeah, if you can do things, in, if you can present your ideas in a non-adversarial method, yeah. that makes it a lot more acceptable. And you want to get other people to buy in on your ideas. Uh, when we were doing large projects, you never want to be the only guy waving the flag. You want to get you and your yeah. buddies and the other people and say that we all feel this way, okay? Or when you go to somebody with a problem situation, Ask them, well, how do you feel about that? What do you think about that? Rather than telling them what they should be thinking. Absolutely. You can get around to that eventually, but you can elicit that pathway by starting with getting their take on the situation, seeing how they view things. That way you're less likely to get into a conflict and you can more likely get through on the path of least resistance. Hold, hold on, self. I'll let you finish in a minute. Um. <laughs> yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> no, I think, I think to, to actually compliment what you're saying, uh, what, what we are as advisors, um, yeah. we, we are not dictators or your job rule is bringers. We're, we, we're yeah. there to help. Absolutely. I am a consultant, right? That is, you pay me for my opinion, right? I don't tell you what to do. I'm here to help, right? And, and, and you're there to advise. If this client decides, if the customer decides, I'm not going to do that. I don't care. That's okay. That's fine. It's not a big deal, right? That's their decision. Your job is to inform, make your recommendation, do the thing, and if they decide they don't want to do it, you can't stop them, right? That's okay. Well, also, you know, everybody knows about the seven-layer network model, right? Yeah, I'll know that. Well, it's a good burrito. I, yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's a big burrito, right? There. Well, actually, actually, that's a little short-sighted because there's actually nine layers. The other two are management and politics. So you always have to keep that in play. Politics seems like an ugly word, but you can learn to make it work for you, and it can be very powerful in your career. So uh, be patient, use the tactics and the techniques of good communications, listening well to other people, asking them for their thoughts and ideas, get as much information as possible before you open your mouth and say, but, and now this is what I think. And it'll be taken a lot clearer. Let me, I just want to say something explicit, which is perhaps was not obvious to me. Um, you have to deal with an attitude problem. Technical people think they're smart, and they think other people are dumb for not knowing technical things. And you have to realize that you have an emotional problem and fix it. It's like a disease. And until you can, you can begin by trying to pretend to be nice, and that's better than nothing, but people will still sense that you 
hold them in contempt, like a dog knows you don't like dogs. You have to really get over thinking you're better than other people. And the fundamental issue here is they hire the technical person because they don't know that stuff. So when you come to them, why are you, you're an idiot, you don't even know this stuff. They say, well, you're an idiot because you shouldn't expect me to know this stuff. I hired you to figure it out and explain it to me in terms I can understand. But uh, at first I was the same guy. I got nowhere in my job because I kept disrespecting the boss. And then one day the boss came in and I said, you know, I calculated that we lost $200,000 last year because everyone got the flu and it did all of that after a month and we hired a bunch of temps to do the work and the temps did it all wrong and we had to do it over. And the next day he brought in a nurse to give everybody flu shots. That was the one time I did my job right. I took the problem and turned it into his language and it's not wrong that he wanted that, although I thought it was. He's just got a different job. He's steering the ship. The gobbledygook about the details are not what he wants. He wants actionable business decisions. I have analyzed all this complicated junk, and you can either do this or that. And here's what I recommend. That's what he wanted, and I didn't understand that. Anyway, I want to make one quick comment on something, and then I want to get to the next question. A lot of what we're talking about is strategy here, but then you wonder, well, how do I apply that? Well, a tactic that I use sometimes in dealing with people is, if you have a group of people, somebody you got to get across to, you got to get a message to, but it's like oil and water, the two of you just don't get along. But you might have another person on your team that you have a relationship with. Use them as a go-between to forward your ideas. They're seen as a friendly. You'll accomplish your objective by using those other people and get the message out to the people that need to have it. So the with that, I'd like champions. to get another. Yeah. yeah. Building champions. Building champions, that's it. So, Horizontal and, and, and then vertical. Yeah. Anyway, let's get to our next question here. Sure, sure. Um, question is along the lines of builder versus breaker. For your core team member, is there a percentage that you would like to see? 90% breaker, 90% builder, 50-50? 50-50. Describe that for me. Uh, so you have uh, someone that comes from software. They build databases. They build networks. And they also, in their free time, go and rip apart servers and look for O days in code. And they could go 50-50. They could go 90% on one. The only thing I look for is if you can break it, at least tell me how to fix it. Yeah, you got to be able to don't, tell Don't me. just walk yeah. up to me with a problem. Yeah, please do not walk. Like, I mean, really, we're in the solutions business. We happen to generate problems as a byproduct. But the reality is you're in the solutions business. So if you can't deliver a solution, a problem is not a... You know, that's we not an exciting discussion. Yeah, we have plenty of problems, dude. Yeah. Legitimately why I say 50-50, yeah, because yeah. The, if, if you cannot fix it, I don't care if it's broken. What, what area of security I mean, I care, do you want to go into? Let's yeah. start there. Yeah, that's actually a good question. Uh, I'm already in security. What, I come, what, what, what do you want to be role? when you grow up? Yeah. This? <laughs> Fire truck. <laughs> what, 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 yeah. what, what particular role are you are, are you re re referencing to? Like, um, so either like a prime pen tester, security engineer, uh, core internal security audit team. Gotcha. So like audit, I, I would audit's not security. Y yeah, I, I, I wasn't even going to go there. I was going to be nice and just say builder. There. But um, yeah, yeah, pen tester definitely fifty fifty. Engineer probably seventy thirty. Yeah, the engineers are forward-looking, right? Yeah. Pen testers are they, sweeping they, they, up the crap that everyone. Yeah, left literally, like a, a solid, a solid security engineer, especially like this is going to be a bit of a digression. You can argue with me, but a lot of times on a project, they'll start with a waterfall model for like the first three or four quarters and do foundational tooling and then go to agile. It yeah. varies, yeah. but they're they're really kind of, you know, if, if they're really good at it, they're looking at white papers for technologies that are being released in the next 24 months and how they can adapt to that and how they can feature proof of design and. There's a lot of work that goes into that. So I, I would say that you're 100% on. You're right. If you don't know the, how the developers work, how they, how they operate, you're going to have a really hard time convincing them, right? Because you've got to sell them that this is the way we're going to fix the thing or get their support in it. If you come to them and say, hey, you need to stand on your head for the next six months, they're going to go, no thanks, right? <laughs> they're going to yeah. laugh. Yeah. They're going to close the door slowly. Unless they're into that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, everybody's got different preferences. Everybody's got hobbies, right? Yeah. And you should be doing security agile security. As much as you can, absolutely. Cool. Wait, what's agile security, guys? <laughs> we have another question here. Step up, security. sir. Um, Sorry, when you asked away. about tools, uh, he said Kali and something else called Oh, Parrot? Parrot? Yeah. What, what is that? Uh, Parrot's just, I won't even call it competing. It's a complementary uh, distro. Um, it's got a lot of, um, I'm trying to think how to phrase that. They've got a lot of complementary tools. It's just your, your, your choice. Do you want to do like Red Hat or Debian? Linux? Hmm? Linux? So yeah, they're both, oh, yes, they're yeah, both they're Linux. Linux. Sorry. Yeah. Pen, pen test cool. toolkit for Linux, yeah. yeah. 
And, Sweet. And you know, you, you you can get a boot disc with the thing, so you can just pop it in, run and play with it uh, right away. Yeah. Cool. I'll have to check that out. Thank you. Yeah. One, one thing I would say, though, is like either Cali or Parrot, like there's some cool tools that they no longer package well, like uh, DSniff's a great example. Yeah, yeah, DSniff yeah. is still really very, very valuable. DSniff, like, if you want to mess with Layer 2, DSniff is amazing to see if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your Layer 2 stack is going to break in an insecure uh, state and become a hub or something like that. Like, um, you can flood thousands of MAC addresses a minute, and th let's say, like, wireless. Like, uh, old school Aruba, you could use DSniff and just start f slamming away on the interface, and then all of a sudden the controller would fail and all the wireless would drop and become a hub for about two minutes while things were rebooting, and anyway. So, didn't mean to digress, but. Cool. Yeah, and so uh, if I could give some advice, just if you want to get into pen testing, stuff like that, take some time, take your laptop, uninstall Windows, put Linux on there, force yourself to use it for a while. Straight. Not because Windows is bad, you need to know that too, but you already know Windows, I know you do. You have Steam. Um, <laughs> Linux still has Steam, it's fine. Try it out for a while, uh, you're gonna get a ton out of it. Okay. I, I would 100% agree with that. That was the advice I got. I, I was like a junior tech and I was like working with this crusty old Unix guy and he was like, I was like, how do I learn Unix? He's like, it just, yeah, he's like, destroy your laptop or your, your computer, put, put Linux on it. And it was B, actually FreeBSD at the time, so it was, there was no Linux. Linux was terrible at the time. So he was like, put FreeBSD on it, and then that was it. And I did that for like two months, and I was like, I know a lot about Unix now. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm dangerous. <laughs> Hear me. So I have one more question. Um, so I'm a student right now uh, at Moorpark College, going for computer networking, trying to get into security. Um, I'm taking the summer off to do OSCP, um, and I go to every conference I can afford. Um, what else could I be doing or should I be doing um, to get into being a pen tester. You, you want to be a full-time pen tester is what you want to do? Yeah. Um, I, how far, <laughs> where, when do you graduate? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been going uh, my JC for two years because I pivoted. I was a business major. Okay. Uh, took a computer class, loved it, pivoted. So I'm actually really new. Um, I'll probably have my associates uh, in the next year and then I'll transfer to a bachelor's program online, I think. I mean, you should be in competitions. Yeah, you should, you should be, get in CCDC yeah. and CPTC and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would don't go. Know what those are? But yeah. I'll check them out. Like, yeah. uh, you know, there, there's a bunch of kind of college targeted cyber stuff. I know more Park has some stuff. I know uh, some folks out there, and uh, I do know there's a lot of stuff local. I, I would say, I, I guess, what more can you do is keep doing what you're doing, right? I would stay on the path. I, I'd look at maybe some software dev kind of experience that's going to be very valuable when you do source review and some of those type of things. Learn some languages, so like CTF style. It, it's not going to be like pure RE, that's not really the same thing, but it, it's, it can be very valuable, right? So doing that stuff. And then I would say the other thing that's a big need for and a desire for and not a lot of folks really good at is like modern web exploitation stuff. I, I'd say I, I don't see very many people very good at the system stuff, the, the, that kind of traditional Stuff is more is more around, yeah, more 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 around. But there's there's very few folks who are really really good modern web folks. So like bug I mean? bounty. The bug bounties yeah. are valuable. I think if you if you put on your resume you have a, you have a CVE, you're coming out of college, I'd be like, I definitely want to talk to you, okay. right? I definitely would want to know what's going on with you. Cool. Thank you guys. Yeah. Well, thank you. Good luck. Yeah, I, I was gonna say bug bounties, uh, if for no other reason, because if you get it done, then you got money for spring break. Exactly. It's, right. you get, you're getting paid Maybe. to hack shit, yeah. so what's wrong Maybe. with that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you guys for your time. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, just a quick question. I'm thinking about going into forensics, and I know there's, it can be very uh, just burdensome by having to document everything, and I was just wondering how likely is it that you run into re the requirements of having the re having forensics as... Well, what do you mean by you have to document everything? Let me understand that a little better. Well, in the sense of having to just the, the order of having to document who the procedure of who's had the um, laptop, hard drive, whatever. So chain of custody? Chain, chain of custody, custody is yes. called. Right, okay. Uh, well, that's uh, not like, that burdensome, I can tell well, you. It's so usually a form that we fill out and identifies the item that we're taking and uh, who handed it to us, and serial numbers and model but, uh, numbers. But aside like from that. that, it's more of the actual evidentiary portion. Yeah. 
having we, to research that? How often do you run into using that into red team, blue team, or a, oh, a, a side? Well, almost, almost never as a red team, you hope to God. As, yeah. a, as, no, a, as a blue team, it does, sorry, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, no, but as a blue team, it, it yeah. definitely does come up periodically where there's like something legitimate and you need to pull something off a network and do a full-on investigation. I, um, I'm, I'm thinking in the sense of using the same skill set. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, like if I apply this, if I were to learn forensics, how is it applicable to using the same skill set to red or blue? Absolutely. Sorry, that reversing that process. Absolutely, because you, you're you're an incredible communicator. You're like, hey, look at this. Somebody dropped put dropper on this box. It then downloaded like Pony. You can see this child process that's occurred. Okay, you can see where this executed in Excel because they enabled macros or whatever. And you can you can have that whole chain of communication and show a complete kill chain with egress or what have you, that's it's very a, valuable. Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of like, it, it, we're saying what the job is, the job is kind of like, it's almost, it combines some reverse engineering in some situations, but it's really very internals based, okay? You gotta understand the, the lower level of how the operating system and how the applications are working. Because what you're, what you're doing and looking, besides just metadata, uh, what you're really looking at is, you know, what happened and what, and timelines are important okay and you know how this occurred how it moved along and you've got to basically document and dissect each of those things often yeah in certainly in my situation we're involved in litigation and it's usually multi-million dollar problems so when you go into court and you're against the other side or whatever you're doing you know you've got to you got to be right on on all those things and prove what you've done and have tested this in some situations, say that yes, that's the way it happens, and I know why, because I tested that in the lab, and these are the results, and that's what I see happening here, and stuff like so it's it's extremely detail oriented as opposed to, you know, stop this or fix that. It really breaks things down into a great level of detail. So while you can apply those skills to red team and blue team thing, um, you know, it's only one way to get there. You certainly don't need to go always into that level of detail. Um, you know, to, to play on a red team or a blue team. But that's kind of what forensics is. So if that's what you're looking for, you know, you're going to study the internals, how things work, and document processes, and uh, discover what the timeline is of events. So I hope that answers your question. On, on the flip side, though, to, um, to Self's point as well, a lot of law firms now have an umbrella part of their organization that's purely IR. So that's something to think of, too. I don't know if that's something you're interested in, but... Well, that's why I was trying to... Yeah, like you, you, you it, there's, there's definitely, I mean, there's whole conferences dedicated to that, but, oh, yeah. but, but literally, like, talk, talk to some of the larger law firms as well, if you're really, if, or if you have a connection there, or, or this gentleman might be able to have some introductions for you. Um, that, that's a huge and growing part of, of our business, as a general rule of thumb. Yeah, some of them have their own departments now for electronic discovery, which is, you know, which is, you know, a simple way possibly to get into the firm and then to roll into doing more forensics aspects of those investigations and responses. Uh, is there any tools that you would recommend? I know that there's Swift and uh, uh, FTK. Okay, if you're talking about forensic investigative tools, some, well, the big names out there that people will talk about are NCASE. Right. Okay. Um, for yeah, yeah, they're just down the street. Um, NCASE is good. Um, another tool that we use is uh, Blacklight by a company called Black Bag. They're particularly good for Macintosh things. Okay. Uh, there's FTK by Access Data, Forensics Toolkit. Um, and then there's a variety of things on like the Linux, uh, like the, uh, the Kali disk that are useful. We use some of the imaging tools that they have to capture images as well as other things. There's a couple different, you know, forensics kind of goes a couple different ways. You can do forensics that's incident response where, okay, who hacked my network and can I find the virus malware type of thing. But another aspect of forensics is in business and civil litigation. It's uh, intellectual property theft and trade secrets and uh, activities that are going on, um, business fraud, other types of things. So, um, you know, there's different types of investigative stuff there depending on whether it's a civil or criminal cyber type of thing. So they use similar skills, but sometimes there's a few tools that lend themselves more to the network response guy than... Um, you know, looking at uh, Macintosh for something, something civil. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have another question? Uh, yes, please. Hello. Uh, thanks for all the advice for getting into InfoSec, uh, InfoSec career. My question is, so once you're in, 
Can you give some more advice how to advance yourself? Like for 10 years you've been in a pen tester, how can you become a C uh, chief security officer, for example? Politics, get good at politics. <laughs> you want a C-suite job, you better be good at communication and politics. Yeah. I would echo that. I mean, the soft skills become way more valuable the higher you go up the ladder. So if you can organize a team, get stuff done, convince people it's the right thing, get things accomplished, demonstrate results, that's how I see people do it. Yeah, I don't I mean, like yeah. pe people yeah. that demonstrate that level of yeah. leadership. Uh, they understand finance that's really right. well. And money. They yeah. understand risk really well. That's right. Absolutely. And, and the, risk and is just money in another form, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah very, very true. Very true. Yeah. But I'm, I'm dead serious about that. Like. How, how, if you see a, a CTO that's like pure tech, it's not my nature. People are going to usually take a double take. Mm. So, yeah, so you, yeah, you got to understand. So, you got to understand the business, not just the technology, mm, to get yeah. to the C level. Because yeah. now you're playing at that level. Now you're the communicator and the leader of the technical people underneath yeah. you. But you're sitting there communicating with the okay. non-technical types, running the business, making decisions for yeah. business reasons, not because the tech was cool or they wanted this new, uh, yeah, you know, thing. Yeah, your so, peers. Though, sorry, go ahead. So how do I get good at those skills? I, I understand that I need those interpersonal skills. How do I train that? I can't Google that. Y yes, you can. There are books. <laughs> <laughs> there are plenty of books like social engineering. People talk about social engineering. Social engineering is weaponized soft skills. So, okay? Yeah. So like that, that's exactly what social engineering is. Okay? Have you ever gotten a... Who's gotten pulled yep. over and convinced a cop not to give him a ticket? That's soft skills. Okay? Have you ever, have you ever been in the DMV and like they're not going to do the thing for you and you want them to do it? That's soft skills. Right? That's what we're talking about. And there's a million books out there called like things like... Uh, emotional communication and how to have difficult conversations. There's a million books out there, and these are all great things. They're the classics are like, you know, uh, the Carnegie stuff, yes, right? Yes. The Dale Carnegie. Friend, when friends and influence people, all these. There's a million soft. Go look at sales books. That's Pretty much, soft yeah, skills. Every but, every sales book ever is what you want to do. But, exactly. But what what you just brought up though is actually something that's interesting because typically people who want to be yes Toastmasters 100%. Uh, typically people who want to be ICs stay ICs usually, or they become architects, which a grown-up IC. They don't usually jump over to <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> CISO yeah, or whatever. Yeah, right? Right? So, so it's, it's typically uh, you'll diverge into management before uh, you'll become a crazy yeah. great pen tester. Very rarely do I see mature pen testers jump into management. Like I can list them on this hand. And, and to be fair, this is going to sound weird, but I, like when you start talking to executives, they're like, "This is hard." The tech. They don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, they they like, it. like really weird. It's ma managing up, managing down. Like it becomes yeah. all about people and less about technology. In fact, yeah. It, there's no, so yeah, that's when you just start talking about risk. This, and the C-suite is not a technology office. No. It's a it's a people for office. You have to. You have to. Oh, this hurts to say. <laughs> give up. <laughs> you have to give up some of your tech. Yeah. <laughs> you have to let other people no. become better at it than you. You'll never touch and a keyboard follow again. You. Oh, no. Yeah, <laughs> you have to move. You have to move to the next level, and that re and requires that you need to focus on that. And, in, and the only way to do that is to leave some. You can't write perfect code every night anymore. You have to let other people do that. Find those people. Have them, you know, as great minions. But you need to move to the next level, and that's the people in the soft tech side. How many CTOs do you think write software every day? Yeah, I know like two, well, three. Okay. okay, I want to. I want all the experience is good though, but you need to move past that to get to the next level. It, it, here's another option: don't get promoted. This is what I did <laughs> because I made this observation at my college. The normal path is you become a part-time teacher, then you become a full-time teacher, and you actually know far less, and you begin to go out of date, and then you move into management where you know nothing, and I. <laughs> was reluctant to be promoted, and I'm glad I got old enough, because when I was young, I would have to climb the ladder. And the fact is, the common ladder is to give up being technical, and for a lot of us, I would rather just take less money and stay technical. So it is possible, but you have to beat off people trying to promote you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so have Wait, we, have we are you trying you to get promoted? Is that, is that how you get promoted? <laughs> yeah. Wait, you don't so get, are you I convinced now you'll never go for sea level management? It's over, you're going to stay a pen tester for life? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one point is like, what can you do to get it promoted? But like, even if you want to get oh. promoted, yeah. so like every CV for a CSO says, please demonstrate that 
trackable record of being a good CSO. So how do yeah, you, but, like, this is a chicken and egg problem. The best advice I can give you is cross-train. Seriously, like, at, go, actually go to a PM and say, hey, why are you passionate about project management? Yes. I'm not joking. Like, yeah. just start cross-training. Manage money. Yeah. If you manage money and make money work for the company, they will be interested in what else you can do. Because, like, mild shock, like, PMs are sometimes just as passionate about project management as we are about Dude, it's a P Project management is hard, right? You think that's easy? That is not easy. No. That is that is really hard, right? Being a good PM and managing a lot of money is really, really hard. It's like juggling hey, and thanks. herding cats. One question? Hi. I'm trying to transition out of accounting into IT, and I feel like I'm 18 again. <laughs> That's good, though, right? Feels good, yeah. Wants. <laughs> and so um, my question for you is, um, can you suggest some security-related roles that might leverage my accounting and business background? Right. Audit. audit. Yeah. yeah. Well, 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 audit. Wait, wait. So, like, audit, IA, or those are def those are definitely yeah. awesome opportunities for you. Another one, and this is going to sound weird, is actually going the forensics route. Yep. Like, for, on the forensic side, forensic you have an accounting, accounting background. Yeah, this, this is this oh is not an exaggeration. Like, people will fall over backwards to want to hire you. That mm -hmm. I'm not joking. Are you, you a CPA? Uh, I, I I don't like accounting that. No, much. no. But if you have okay. a CPA, if you have yeah. like a forensic accounting background or any of that, and you mm -hmm. leverage that in I, a company, that can be very valuable. I have studied um, introductory and advanced forensic accounting, and so. But I really didn't want to have to do the CPE for accounting because I really like technical. But, but he's better. not talking about forensic no. accounting. He's just talking mm -hmm. about doing computer, computer forensics. forensics yeah. But With, accounting skills will help. Because right. yeah. literally you're going to be talking about how these people effectively oh, yeah. either stole by time or resources hundreds of thousands of dollars from the company. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really valuable to be able to say, um, here's a timeline, here's what's occurred, here's why it occurred. Uh, but, but maybe to answer your question more directly, um, you've already got this one silo that you've built up. You don't need to to necessarily rely on that, you want to build up the other one. Um, I, I would probably start with training at smaller conferences like this, simply mm -hmm. um, around probably macro level um, security than, than something really granular. Okay. Uh, so, so to that point, like an introduction to red to like red teaming, something like that would probably be really valuable to you. What, what okay. kind of security role do you want? Yeah. Well. Um, I mean, it's I mean, like saying I want. It's like saying I want to get into medicine. That's a lot. There's a lot right. of things there, right? <laughs> right, and I'm actually not really sure at this point. Are you Are you interested more in defense or offense? Um, I thought that maybe leveraging my accounting skills on a red team would be kind of fun because I could tell them some parts to attack, and so, like for instance, if I saw someone going and looking through the accounting policy or the the org charts um, for the controllers department, I would probably be somewhat alarmed. You know, audit does a lot of that with the, the tracking software yeah. for where people are. I, I would say that would be the easiest. Yeah. Um, the, the internal auditors do a lot of things that are probably similar to what you do, and it would be an easy transition. Yeah. Because they'll have they'll have software that they're monitoring. Um, data loss, data protection software, and things like that. This DLP stuff, where you can see who in the office opened this folder, touched that. So, mm -hmm. so it sounds like you're accounting for things and feeding the other group from a procedural uh, from standpoint. procedural standpoint. It sounds like what and you're, you're going to deal with compliance issues and procedures of that sort. It sounds to me that that's probably your easiest venue is to is to pursue something in audit. And that okay. also get you near people. Who are in security? That's yeah. right. Who are You'll technical people? So, so you can you be like, grow. yeah, and you can be like, hey, how did you do that? That's really interesting, or whatever. Gets you some network effect, right? And, and, okay. and on the flip side, are you, are you willing to travel for work, things of that nature? Or? Um, I'm open to travel. Um, okay. Maybe not 100% of the time. Okay. But. Yeah. Can I say just as a as a heads up, like consultants, right? Like I'm a pen tester. The same place doesn't need pen testing every day, right? So I'm on the road 50% of the time. Okay. So that's a real life. You know, that it's somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of your time is going to be in hotel rooms, which is not like on vacation travel. It's like, like imagine being jet lagged, you know, 50 or 60 percent of the time of your life. It's pretty crappy sometimes. Yeah, you're so, yeah, it's you're, it's yeah. You're not done until the blaze is out. That's right. You 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 get parachuted into some place. You have a week to make it work, right? You don't know what the deal is. Everything you you were told is wrong. So be ready to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, it looks like we, it looks like we're running out of time. <laughs>
So, all right, all right, all right. We'll see one more. So um, I have a question because I want to try to help the accountants out there, the physical therapists, the musicians, um, try to find forays into the security profession. And um, it's in my experience, if you have a Java programmer standing in front of you, depending upon what their background is and what their personality is, you might tell them, you'd be great for the Hollywood industry. You should go work for a government contractor, or I mean, there's you should look for a small startup, you should look for a giant company, right? Depending upon the person in front of you with a particular skill set, you might send them to different industries for the same role, but in completely different industries because they'll do better if they, if they find a career path that works. So my question to you is, based on your experience, your seasoning in the security world, what, 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 are, what, are, the, what are the different, how do we give people advice? that are coming from other careers, trying to get into security, what would be the right person to look for a security job in the healthcare industry or biomedical industry? Uh, who should look for startups? Who should look for the big three-letter agencies? What, you know, what, what, what kind of Typically the three letters are ex-military anyways, and they're yeah, if funneled you, in okay, immediately yeah. after they get out. Exactly. But, but beyond yeah. that, I don't think you should focus on any of that. You no. should focus on, if you want to do something, go do it and find a place that needs that. I, you I would, don't have to be in an industry to be in security. I guess I would say that like in what I've seen, I've worked at small companies and big companies, and shout out to your resume workshop, by the way. What's up, Lori? The, <laughs> um, the, um, I, I was seeing that the smaller, smaller the company you work for, the more jobs you get to do, and the more yep. exposure you'll get, the more willing they are ever to take a risk on you. A big company wants to, a very defined role with some security that you'll be able to do that specific role very discreetly. So if I was starting out, and like I started out, I started out very small firms, right? Because someone needed to take a risk on me mm -hmm. personally, right? Needed to say, okay, Jeff, I'm willing to let you try this thing out because I trust you, right? And that, that growth in my career came from personal mentorships and relationships I built with my boss and but with the other parts of the company. And smaller companies, it's much easier to do that. The bosses two people away, maybe down the, down, the, down the hall, as opposed to in another city or another state, right? Um, so it's a different organization. So I'd say, I would say smaller companies are better for starting out if you're looking to expand what you're doing. Yep. Gives you some gives you some flexibility. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna add something to that. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dispute that. No, actually, I'm gonna say that's a good idea, <laughs> but it's not an absolute. No. And, and here's the reason why. Um, you learn certain things with a small company. You're the chief cook and bottle washer. You're doing everything. Okay, and that's cool. You can get into those jobs, you know, probably easier than some. But at the same time, from a career standpoint, and eventually trying to get into management and make that, you know, C-suite, you need to learn how big companies operate. They've got a budget. The little guy does everything in the company. The, the, in the big company, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're learning a lot more. They can put training money behind you, which can accelerate your development a lot faster. You're going to not have to figure it all out on yourself, but you're going to be learning from people that are, that are doing some of that. So you're going to be able to leverage that experience on top of what you bring to the party. And, uh, you know, you want to get, as I was told early in life, is make sure you get that corporate staff time in somewhere along your career. So I used to bounce in and out of doing my own thing, then an opportunity to come to work for at and I'd go hang out with them for a while, then I'd go do my own thing, then I'd go back and work for McDonnell Douglas for a while, they trained me some more stuff, then I'd go and do my own thing, then I, you know. So, you know, you can bounce in and out of here and try to get the best out of each of these. So hopefully that helps. All right, well, we seem to have wrapped up to the end of our time here today. Hope you all had fun. I want to thank our esteemed group of panelists for sharing their insights and experience. And I want to thank all of you for participating and coming here and wish you all the best of luck in your new careers.